funds for several more students for our college scholarship. So we want to thank Lydia and all of you. Alessandra Mazzucato, could you stand up so everybody can see who you are? <laughs> Nancy, Nancy Beck. before she signs the cookbooks later on. Now, I know it's going to be very tempting to flip through the cookbook, but please try to resist the temptation uh, while she's talking so we don't have a lot of rustling of pages. Um, I just want to start out by saying that uh, when Alessandro gathered the program committee together uh, last spring to discuss opportunities uh, for programs at Dorothea's house, I had just um, come from having dinner with my sister and my daughter at Felidia, one of her restaurants in New York. And despite the fact that that very day Lydia had received the prestigious James Beard Award as Outstanding Chef, she took the time to come over to our table as well as other tables and greet us very graciously. And my sister said afterwards, she said, you know, there's, there's something about her. She said, I, I don't know what it is because she doesn't look like mom looked, but there's something about her that reminds me of our mom, and I just had to resist the urge to hug her. <laughs> and I, I'm sure that's a sentiment that Lydia hears over and over. And once you meet her or have seen her on her television program, you will all agree. Her warmth and her charm and her sincerity is so effusive and, and her desire to make you experience the best that Italian cuisine has to offer and that you know she's really sincere. She makes you feel like your aunt Giuseppina or your neighbor next door. And on top of that, she's a fabulous cook, a successful businesswoman, and the star of a nationally televised cooking show that we all anticipate every week. And here in New Jersey, those of us who are Lydia files are fortunate enough to get our Lydia fix three times in one weekend <laughs> because we can watch her on public TV in New Jersey and the New York station and the Philadelphia station. <laughs> so from Aragosto to Zabaglione, there is nothing that she prepares that doesn't make me salivate and want to rush to the kitchen and start cooking. But aside from that, in her show, she tries to educate us on the science involved in cooking foods. And that's knowledge that she gained not only at the hand of her relatives in uh, growing up in Italy, but uh, through classes she took early in her career at Hunter College, at Queens College, at the New School in Manhattan, all while running a highly successful restaurant and raising two children, Tanya and Joseph. Aside from owning Philidia, she also runs with her son, Becco, a restaurant in New York's theater district. She's also a partner in the wonderful seafood restaurant, Esca, with her son and Mario Batali. And away from New York, she owns Lydia's Kansas City and Lydia's Pittsburgh. She's also developed a line of fine pasta sauces called Lydia Flavors of Italy, and is the founder of Esperienze Italiane, an international tour company that sponsors high-end tours in Italy. And as if that weren't enough, Lydia uses her talents as a chef to organize benefits and rally support for humanitarian causes. She has helped raise funds for organizations like UNICEF and UNIFEM, and founded the Good Samaritan Hospital to adopt and aid victims of the Bosnia War. In 1999, the nonprofit Lydia Maticchio Bastianich Foundation was established to help indigent, abandoned, <coughs> oppressed, ill, or handicapped people. The foundation has provided help to immigrants trying to integrate into the United States from war-torn Croatia, Albania, Yugoslavia, <coughs> or other Eastern European countries. This house, Dorothea's house, was founded in memory of Dorothea Van Dyke McLean another woman who helped newly arrived immigrants from Italy. 
I'm sure that if Dorothea were alive today, she would be very pleased that we are hosting a program featuring Lydia Maticchio Bastianich. So let's have a nice round of applause and hear him.
sort of the, 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 the in me to retain my culture, but to retain it with food. Uh, because if I came here, I was 12, I was very young, I was um, get sort of very Americanized, and I feel well, very American, I feel uh, uh, quite, quite American, and yet I feel very Italian. Uh, and it was this, this constant wanting to, to keep, to be connected to the culture, I guess, that I was cut off first to ground, whatever, that I used food as a medium. And, uh, and in turn then, I think I wanted my adopted culture, country, to sort of know what my original country was and bring the two of them together. And I continue to do that with food. Uh, uh, and for me, it's, it's my media, it's, uh, it gives me a lot of rewards. Uh, besides, I think the culture itself, um, emotions. Um, and um, why does everybody love it? Why does everybody love to go to Italy? Why does everybody think that the, life, the Italian lifestyle is so wonderful? I certainly think that at the bottom of it, the table is the major component. <laughs> and, and not the table just because of nutritional or gustatory situations, but because at the table, much happens. Much happens in, in, in communication of emotions, of, of, of giving, of taking. Uh, uh, but, but also, as, as Italians, I think that um, we love beautiful things. You know, I said, why at a time? We need to see beautiful things, we need to hear beautiful things, we need to eat good things. And I think all of this, and those are priorities that Italians put before themselves, uh, before other things. So their quest, their hard work and everything is for an ultimate end of living well. And uh, uh, I think that in my shows, in my book, I communicate that. And, and again, uh, food will, will certainly begin to, to, to bring that feeling uh, at home of, of sort of living well. But so I was uh, uh, 12 and I came, we went to, to, to Trieste. In, in Trieste, we stayed for about two years. And we stayed in a, in a uh, it was a political refugee camp. It was actually a camp. Because after we stayed with Mayan for a while, uh, of course, it became difficult for her in the aftermath of the war to, to support. And by then, I think my parents had decided that even if it was difficult to find a job, that they would move on and migrate and find a new world for, for their children to, to grow in. And so we stayed for two years in, in Zosapo was the camp, it was political, political refugees. And we came here in 1958, and we were brought here by the Catholic Charities. We had nobody here, so they had the charities pay for our trips. They brought us to, um, they found that, I think we first uh, stayed in a hotel. It was the Edison Hotel on 36th Street in Manhattan. It was, it was a horn and heart on the corner, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my brother and I were mesmerized by those machines. <laughs> Tasted grapefruit, uh, uh, jello, <laughs> tapioca, uh, and those things are very vivid in you because I guess I was into food as, as, as it was from the early, and really I remember those. But uh, this, we really did settle, uh, and actually, um, the Catholic Charities found a home in North Bergen, New Jersey. So we moved to North Bergen, New Jersey, and found a job for my father and a job for my mother. My mother is an elementary school teacher, but of course, she couldn't practiced that, so she came to, uh, went to work in a factory, and he was a mechanic, and he had a job for, for uh, I think it was General Motors. But uh, uh, within six months, a cousin of ours, a distant cousin who had sort of jumped ship, found out that we were here, uh, brought us to Astoria, Queens, and that's where our sort of life uh, setting uh, began in America. Um, went on to junior high school, high school, and began college, and my interest at that time was really not focused on food. It was in the sciences. I liked biology and I liked chemistry. Uh, and um, I thought that I might go in that direction. But I somehow gravitated always to, towards food. And uh, uh, part-time jobs in, in bakeries, in restaurants. And, uh, and uh, then I met uh, my then husband who was in the restaurant business. And I think that just sort of uh, put things in up. Ah, maybe that was one of the reasons why we were sort of gravitated toward each other. And at 24, 
I was married with one child and I opened my first restaurant. Wow. <laughs> now, um, I was always sort of, um, even I, I was 16 and I remember that uh, um, I, I, I just always took the bull by the horns, I did what needed to be done and I didn't, uh, you know, I wasn't afraid of it. I think just the whole trip of coming here and in the camp and, and, and having to fight for oneself a bit more because um, in the camp, I have only good memories. I don't have any resentment at all of my life. I think that I did what happened. Uh, my my, my, my um, uh, destiny was, was, has really enriched me a lot. So even in the camp, we were in a line, you know, and I remember going to line for food, and I remember getting my share of spaghetti and pomodoro with, with a little bit of cheese and, and, and an apple. I, 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 I think that was all ultimately positive for me. But it built the character that I am. He said, my character is sort of, you know, sort of you, you fend for yourself in a sense, you make it happen. So um, at 24, I was not a chef, certainly. Uh, I had no official training, and that took a back. Uh, I had chefs in my family. My aunt, the one in three years, who was a wonderful chef, and I spent some time with her. And uh, my grandmother had a little sort of inn before that I can remember, and we made, they produced all the food that we ate, from, from making aloe, to making wine, to the skin kappa, to making prosciutto, to drying beans uh, for the winter, uh, to going to the mill for flour. I recall all of those in very young, and I was still very young, but I think that that was a, a sort of it built a reference library for me as far as flavors and, and awareness of <coughs> taste. Um, so at 24, I, I had, and I, what, the direction I'm going to take is I basically want to take it to the Italian American and what is the difference between the Italian American food and Italian food, and there is a difference. Um, I, uh, I realized, so in the working in the restaurants, that the food that was served in the restaurant was not the food that I ate at home. It was different. And I said, well, maybe, you know, I don't know all the other regions because, you know, I was young. Maybe in the other regions of Italy, this is what they serve and so on. Uh, but certainly coming back and seeing it was not. It was a different kind of food. Uh, so we hired uh, an Italian-American chef. I became his new chef. And for 10 years, uh, I professed my, my, my uh, um, profession as a professional chef. Uh, but also I learned the Italian-American cuisine, which was parallel. There was Italian elements, but it was not the cuisine that was in the middle. Um, in the meantime, I sort of in, 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 in began to introduce the true result, so the result, the way we ate it at home, and the polenta, and the gnocchis. And by the time, 10, day, ten years after we opened Palladia, I was my own uh, a chef, and I cooked <coughs> the traditional food of Italy, and that's what I'm known for. Uh, and uh, for, for, for Lydia opened in 81, there for 20, 22 years, that I'm known as the lady of Italian, traditional Italian cooking. And I really hold myself to that because I think that, that I have a mission and, and, and I, I, feel, I feel it almost sacrilegious to, to, to sort of forfeit that mission. And that mission is that I need to transmit the Italian culture, the Italian culinary culture in the true form what the Italian people need to my other people, the American people. Uh, so therefore you say a chef, you know, could be invented? Yes, I could. I do not uh, venture there. I do not invent. None of the recipes that I have are mine that I invented. They're all part of the Italian uh, patrimony, uh, 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 of the Italian culinary patrimony, and I work with them, I freshen them up but they re I really try to bring Italy to, to my diners. Now, Italian art. So, uh, after I received my accolades or whatever as the Italian, traditional Italian, uh, we went on to Pittsburgh, we went on to Kansas City, and I saw that Italian American cuisine was alive and well, and people just loved it. And, and I said, you know, there's a reality here. And I said, I really like to pursue that, and that's when I decided I would write this book and put the Italian-American uh, cuisine or the Italian-American table. And, and uh, uh, do a little research, and since I have, in those 10 years, I know I have learned all of the recipes, most of the recipes of the Italian-American, I knew it. I said, I just have to put it in written form 
that the Italian American cuisine is a, is, a, is a wonderful cuisine, is a very valid cuisine. It is not the traditional cuisine of the Italians that live in Italy, but it is a cuisine of the Italian immigrants and their adaptation in this new country when they came. So I did a little research, and uh, it seems that the, the, the first big influx of Italian immigrants came at the turn of the, turn of the century. And they basically came from two regions, from Campania and from Sicily. And uh, the Italian-American cuisine or recipes really reflect, are based on those two regions cooking. But you can imagine that when those people came at that time, uh, they came here with these wonderful memories of, of recipes and flavors, but they did not have the ingredients. They did not have the olive oil, they did not have the Samarzano tomatoes, they did not have the Torino, Romano, Salto, they did not have the Parmigiano, the Chano. And therefore, anything that they cooked, had to be different, had to come different. Now let's say I went back to Campania and I went in, in the homes of housewives and I said, can you tell me, can you show me, how do you make your Sunday sauce, or the Sunday of who has been, this is known here. And it was basically very simple. Uh, a shoulder of pork, some onions, some pl uh, plum, uh, plum tomatoes, some marzano tomatoes, a little bit of oregano and salt, and uh, a cooking of about an hour and a half, some good olive oil, and this was their Sunday sauce. Quite different from the Sunday sauce that we find here in the United States, where the sauce is cooked for two, three hours, has a lot of oregano, a lot of garlic, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of meatballs and sausages and, and bracciole. <laughs> and it, 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 well, there is, there is a, 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 a reality there. First of all, the use of meat, uh, these, these immigrants came because, of course, necessity and they found the abundance of meat here. So using more meat in their Sunday sauce signified that they live well and they use much more. Garlic was one element that was the same in flavor. Therefore, they found it here. They used a lot more garlic to give it the pungency, the intensity of flavor that they remember back home. They did not have the Samarzano tomato or the plum tomatoes, even though the tomato is a New World fruit, but it's in its form more as a fruit therefore much more watery, much more acidic, so they had to cook it longer to, to sort of get the, the density of sauce, uh, add maybe a little bit of sugar, and the spices are the same, so your dry oregano possibly that they brought with them, using a lot of that. So there is, um, you can see a cuisine really transforming out of necessity into a new cuisine. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's a venerable cuisine, it's a wonderful cuisine that shows the adaptation of the Italians when they first uh, came and continue. The, the interesting thing about it is that we are four generations, five generations removed, and the cuisine is alive and thriving and living well. And uh, I, I discussed it with some sociologists and I said, why, why, uh, how, you know, usually things taper off and fade. Why is this, this culture so persistent? Uh, it's almost incestuous in the sense that it feeds on itself to, to, from generation to generation. Um, I, I, I haven't uh, gotten the answer yet, certainly, <laughs> but I think it's, it's wonderful uh, to see that uh, Italians, even three, four, five generations, connect as being Italians Americans through that, that, that food. Um, so um, I, I really, uh, this book is, is, is in, in honor to those immigrants and putting that cuisine in its right place because the press uh, in the last few years have begun to sort of uh, brandish and saying, well, it's the, the, the imposter cuisine. It's not the real Italian cuisine. It's a real cuisine. It's a cuisine of the immigrants. It's not the cuisine that is uh, traditionally Italian in Italy, but it is the cuisine of the Italian and their adaptation to, to in the United States. So uh, uh, the book is doing very well, and people are responding to it, and uh, I'm delighted to, to have shared that with them. Uh, I'm going to open up some questions, because otherwise I can go on and on and on. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you have any questions. <coughs> yes. Uh, Trieste is in uh, Friuli. Trieste is in Friuli, yes. We, we've, been there, we've been to Udine a couple of times. Do you know uh, Frico? I know Frico. <laughs> Is it possible to get the ingredients and a recipe? Yes, my <laughs> second book. My second book. <laughs> you have you have all the uh, Africo is is traditional. Um, uh, you need Montasio cheese, 
And it's just a melting down cheese with potatoes cooking in it. And uh, it's, um, uh, and you know, they used, because they used all the rinds of the cheese and all of that, uh, the frugality of what we see using everything. So putting in a big cast iron pot and letting all of that onions, raw potatoes, and this cheese and just slowly, slowly cook for two, three hours until it sort of melts into a cake. It is, it is, it is quite heavy and rich, but it is, but it is, but it is wonderful. I, I give some, some, some uh, alternatives, some, some options on how to lighten it up in my second book, which is, which is uh, really actually, it's, it's, it's also interesting because I brought, brought my version back to Friuli and some of the restaurants are doing it there. So it's quite interesting what part of the Italian uh, uh, experience is going back to Italy and the Italians are picking up, so it's, it's very interesting. Uh, but uh, it's a great dish. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes? I heard recently on the radio, um, some organization is, is giving restaurants a, a kind of a stamp of Italian authenticity. Um, <laughs> And I thought it was really interesting. Um, I was just wondering if you have heard about that and what your kind of position or take um, on that is, what your observation is. I think, I think what the Italians are trying to do um, is, is valid. Let, let's see now with, with uh, United Europe. Uh, one of the things that concern me certainly that uh, these traditional products get homogenized within all of Europe. And that a Parmigiano Reggiano could be made in Denmark and so on. So the Italians are trying to safeguard uh, uh, the DOCG, the Origine Controllata. And I think that it is, it is almost necessary because <coughs> if you lose, if you homogenize that, uh, then you lost the culture to some extent. Um, in, in, in taking that a step further, they are trying to sort of um, authenticize or, or give the seal of approval to restaurants abroad it's going to be an awful difficult task, and I don't know which guidelines uh, would, would really uh, do justice to something like that. But the consciousness of, 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 of you know, trying to really do, because um, everybody's doing Italian food. Italian food, food, food is the number one ethnic food uh, in America, mm -hmm. followed by Chinese, Mexican, and then French. Uh, so. Um, and, and uh, I travel around, and as I see you know, the way the Italian uh, food is interpreted and sold as Italian, sometimes uh, uh, it's, it's, it, it is, it leaves a lot to be uh, thought about. But I don't know whether that seal will do the trick. But don't bring a consciousness down there. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Do you find that your friends don't invite you for dinner? <laughs> Person and uh, I enjoy the simplest of food. So um, uh, if it's if it's natural, even a piece of bread, I'll uh, be happy with. And my friends know that. And but yes, there is. A, but I assure them right away. You know, don't worry about it or whatever. So I don't know. Are you the cook today? <laughs> Tell us about your son Joseph's wine importations. I'm very interested from your show. Uh, yes, we um, in in my sort of quest, as I said, I was 12 years old. So uh, my quest to, to regain and to maintain my original uh, um, heritage, I continue and always need to go back and and research and it takes three, four, five trips a year and go to producers and go to. Uh, up and down the, uh, the, 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 the peninsula, just trying to make sure that I am up to date with, with what is happening in Italy. And with my children, as they grew up, they were always in tow, you know. Uh, it's not that, uh, you know, I just left them somewhere, even though I had grandma. They always came with me because I also wanted them to be to be with me. So therefore, they were exposed, um, you know, subliminal in a sense, they were exposed to all of this. And, and I told them when, when, when uh, they were going to school, and even during their, 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 their school years, uh, I told them, this is not what you want to do. You need to go to school, you need to get an education, <laughs> and, and that is that. And, uh, and so they did. Uh, my son Joseph went on 
to Boston College when I became an analyst for Merrill Lynch. Uh, but then, after a few years, decided this is what he wanted to do. Um, my daughter Tanya went to Milan. She loved the arts. Uh, she uh, went on and got a PhD from Oxford in Renaissance art history, and that's where the, the sort of the trips come in. So they did. Uh, they, were, they were educated. So for me, that was a great. Uh, that's what I needed. That's what I guess. My parents brought us here for, and in turn, it was a quest that we needed to do. But then, slowly, they all came back. <laughs> my son, my son, and that's because, I don't know, because, I know why, because their mom was having a great time, and they said, this is a good business to be in. <laughs> I mean, I was just enjoying it, and I still enjoy it. Uh, and and um, so, when, when um, he decided to come in, he went, we said, okay. Uh, you have your business savvy now from Wall Street, whatever, you really need to spend a year in Italy. And he did, he went up and down and Italy for a year to work with. But then I had befriended so many producers and all that Italy was almost every time I knew somebody. And he did a year between restaurants and production of cheeses and wine production and, uh, um, and came back and then uh, worked with me and opened back and so on. But uh, every every summer, every vacation, they went back to Italy. So we spoke Italian, so they were very close to Italy. We, um, we decided uh, five years ago, although we have land in East Italy, which is not Italian, <coughs> we decided to buy, uh, again, some more land in Friuli, and we bought a vineyard, and about five years ago, we, we started producing wine, and it is his, it is his passion, and we have some now in, in uh, Tuscany. Uh, so it's, um, it's, and he takes his children back. My daughter made, married an Italian. Their children speak Italian. So it's a continuum. Uh, every summer, they spend the whole vacation with the kids in a city, in the vineyard or whatever. It is, I think, you know, my growth was not one out of, uh, out of business savvy and wisdom, although you need to have that to sort of keep it going. It was one of seeing an opportunity, an opening, and saying, gee, you know, I have the possibility to do that. I want to do that. And, uh, and that's how the growth of what I do comes about, with the right people always. Uh, uh, working very close with your family, my, my business is still a family business, uh, is um, I think the, the greatest uh, rewarding achievement of a parent to have <coughs> a child follow uh, to a certain extent and to be a mentor to your own children. Uh, it's been great reward. So both of them want the travels, the other one for the wine and restaurants. It's a family business, and that's what we're growing with. Okay. But I uh, think the wine has been uh, received very well. Uh, received um, three three bicchieri by Gambero Rosso already for the second year, and uh, received the 91 rating by Wine Spectator. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am so proud because it's, it's my son's even though I'm involved, but it's it's kind of follow up to what you said. I've always loved food, but I um, my interest in cooking didn't start until a few years ago, and unfortunately, uh, Winona wasn't quite able to cook the way she was you know, when I was very young, and uh, didn't really have the opportunity to learn from her like I would like to. Um, for someone who's not or doesn't have any family in the restaurant business, what would be, what would be your suggestion? If you had sort of a uh, uh, um, clean slate, what I, what I tell uh, young people is absolutely you get an education for yourself, get your <coughs> bachelor's in something that you love, that you're passionate, that you want to know your matters, whatever. Uh, from then on, uh, go into a culinary school, a good culinary school. Uh, in the interim, you need to spend some time you know, rolling your sleeves up and hands on to the culinary school, really getting and working. You need to find mentors who you really, uh, whose work you, you appreciate and assimilate from them. You need to get yourself to Europe or whichever cuisine you want to innovate, whether it's Chinese or you need to spend some time to understand that cuisine. If it is America, then you need to really travel and see all the different uh, products that you have and, and the culture of the American. Uh, I would say that process uh, would take you ideally um, uh, uh, after you go to culinary school, uh, travel in, in a, a year would be ideal to be abroad. And at least <coughs> about four or five years in the field with people really hands on 
And then you, could, you, you begin at that point, I think, to formulate your own personality in this industry. And, and that's what I think gives you um, strength to success and, and sort of a message when you understand what you want to do and what are your flames, what, is, what, are, you know, like, what are your colors, what is your style if you are an architect and so on. So that would be the, it's, it's, not, it's not a fast, uh, uh, but maybe it's not that long because all along you do get some, a lot of satisfaction and you do, you, you do make a living, you know, you can make a decent living and, and then you sort of flourish. But what's very important is that you find yourself uh, mentors, people that you really believe in what they do and, and what they should do. And then from then on, uh, you have uh, uh, an opportunity to really go out this stuff. Uh, yes. yes. A few months ago, my friend and I we went to New York to a theater, so we decided to look up the theater restaurant. We went to Beko, and I was so impressed by your waiters. First of all, they don't—they're not dressed elegant. They have that lovely white apron. They bring the food to the table in the original pan that they cooked it. They explain what it is, what how it's cooked. And I just was so impressed. And I said to my friend, that's because Lydia wants it like that. In the past, <laughs> I go to a restaurant and I'm intimidated by these waiters that first of all, they don't even know where the fork is, but they look down at me. And if I ask a question, don't you know what that is? And I go, well, I wanted you to tell me what it is. <laughs> so I just want you to know that yeah. I think that's a lovely thing that you it, it, but, but it says a lot about Italian culture, and, and that is that, and sometimes it is taken the wrong way, uh, that Italian restaurants of people that are not Italian, you know, they just sort of, in a way, slap it up or make it easy or whatever. No, Italian uh, is, is uh, elegant in a comfortable situation. I mean, that's what Italian food is all about. Uh, a preparation that's very elegant with prime ingredients done well, but in a relaxed atmosphere, not in a, in a sort of, uh, because it's the food of the Italian people. If you go back, if you're talk, talking about French, let's say that you refer to the French and all cuisine and all that. Uh, those chefs, the birth of those cuisine actually is not out of the food of the populace. It's the chefs of the courts. Now, through Renaissance and so on and before, um, the courts um, uh, had these chefs that were invented you know, to show off their wealth and their and their their monies uh, and whatever they they decorate themselves the, the palaces but also the food to the same growth where they they hire chefs that need to they needed to invent things and make new things and and put birds in in the pot and whatever and, and so that was <coughs> when the revolution in France occurred uh, those chefs had no place to go restaurants certainly were not. They, they, they began opening their own restaurants with that cuisine, and so the old French cuisine does not really reflect the common uh, cuisine, the people of the common French people, which now is coming ever more evident, the Provençal and so on, which is the true cuisine. In, in Italy, even though during the Renaissance and all of that happened, but it didn't remain within the Italian culture to that extent. There, there are dishes you know, that, that, that reflect all of those periods. But uh, the cuisine is still very true to the people that eat it and to, to the soil that it comes from. And, uh, uh, and, and it's a comfortable setting. You know, we, so I'm glad that you, that, you, that you picked that up. Although that also is the first restaurant I, I did with my son. So therefore, you know, much more relaxed. He's, he was young and whatever. And also, um, you know, different price points in restaurant business exclude a lot of people. So I, I thought that I wanted to cross borders uh, as far as price and make my cooking and my flavors available at all, at all price, level, price points. So I also asked, I said, you think I could, you know, Lydia will be here. And the waiter said, well, maybe she will. So at the end, <laughs> at the end of this, I said, oh, but Lydia, I never got to meet said, you need to come back another day. <laughs> <laughs> I do travel from restaurant to restaurant, and there are set dates that I'm there, and I think if you go on the website, you'll know exactly when I'm at this restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> but, I do that. But, I do, but I do surprise them. I do go and, and from restaurant to restaurant just to check on them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
in view of what you just said, how would you characterize the Funda Felidia? Um, the Funda Felidia is um, uh, a wonderful setting, uh, attention to detail in preparation, um, uh, no um, limitations on ingredients. Uh, when the primizia are out, the primizia means the first of, uh, then no matter what it costs, we have it. The truffles, we have it in season. So all the prime things that are not necessary for uh, uh, to, to, for an Italian cuisine as a whole, but it is, it, it, it exemplifies very much the, the cuisine of, of, you know, the ultimate cuisine, the Italian cuisine. So I would uh, uh, differentiate the fact also of of um, uh, the extensive wine list. I mean, it has, we have all this over a thousand to hundred different Italian labels. Um, so this uh, this sort of um, the opportunity for for a dining experience that is that is utmost as far as Italian food goes would be Bolivia, and and then Becca would be wonderful preparations with great ingredients. Uh, white truffles I do not have at Becca. Uh, when you have um, uh, although I have the herbs and everything else, but, but uh, certain provincia maybe I won't have it at Beko as I do in 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 Felidia. Uh, the wine list we have a great program. We have um, uh, about sixty wines for twenty dollars. You see, it's a different philosophy. It's, 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 it's a philosophy of, of really welcoming for people that want to begin to explore the Italian uh, wine uh, wine pro programs and stuff. We have that opportunity because. If you begin and you say, gee, Italian wines are so, the selection is so vast. Where do I begin? You certainly don't want to begin with the two, three, four hundred uh, dollar bottles. Uh, and there's plenty of good twenty dollar bottles out there to be had. So I think that we emphasize that experience and that opportunity. And since we are expert at it, you know, I, we can make those those opportunities available to our diners in different levels. Yes. Well, could you comment on the uh, to a guy, wonderful wine of Friuli, at least I used to love it when I could get it. Now I've understood that the Hungarians are across. Uh, and, uh, to whatever it's yeah. called, to a guy. That's yes. right, and we'll lose the name in about um, two years, I think, a year and a half. And Tokai is a, a, a geographical place in Hungary, presumably where the varietal of Tokai was first. Although uh, the varietal of Tokai in Julia, when it's a Julia, is completely different genetically than the Tokai in yes. Hungary, nonetheless, the Hungarians have claimed uh, uh, their, their right to the name because geographically, like Champagne, mm -hmm. you can only name Champagne if it comes from Champagne, again, going to the DOCG. But wasn't uh, it true that it was occupied by the Hungarian? Uh, that part, that part yeah. was yes. Austria, Hungary. Yes. Hungary that, part Hungary. Was, that, that part was. And Austria. they planted the same grapes, but they didn't come up the same. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, because the, the varietal, the, the grape will respond to the soil, even though it's, it's the same rule. And then you know they, they, they sort of um, um, cross on different uh, roots, root, uh, 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 different roots will yield a different tokaiol. But yes, that area. And that's what's so amazing about that area is that uh, coming from the border, as a uh, looking at myself, my cuisine is also interesting because it has the Austro-Hungarian influence, it has the Slavic influence. I cook the whole area, not just myself. We cook with sauerkraut as well. You know, I cook, I make palachinka, I make goulash, which is part of my heritage. Yes. And uh, uh, you know, uh, I speak five languages. I mean, and I was born bilingual, and then we go on to three languages very easily because of that. It's, it's, uh, 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 and I think that some of the good chefs of the world, uh, like Andre, uh, Andre Saltner, whatever, come from borderline situation where you have uh, in your reference library uh, so many more. It's like a painter have different colors on their palette, so much more. We have those 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 uh, those ingredients, and I cook with them. But uh, certainly that area was not the Austrian-Hungarian uh, uh, rule for uh, was it uh, how many years? Uh, yeah, it was from the from the Franz Franz Josef uh, 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 used to have his summer retreat in Istria and in Trieste. Uh, Carlotta has the, the Castello di Miramare. Uh, uh, is, um, uh, also where they 
built a beautiful castle. So that area, even if you go now, Trieste is very Middle European, the, the architecture of Trieste. It's quite interesting, quite interesting part of the world. <coughs> yes. How did you come to have restaurants, uh, Lydia's, in Kansas City and Pittsburgh? And is that maybe a new concept thing that you might bring to Princeton? <laughs> <laughs> mentioned that before the necessities of Italian cuisine could you elaborate on that a little bit what, what would you consider are the necessities um, in a household the and equipment stones, wise too the maybe corner, the corners oh it's it's wasn't oh, but okay let's begin <laughs> <laughs> I begin certainly with with, with, with olive oil uh, with, uh, with the fresh herbs uh, with the, the, the main starch uh, components, uh, which is you know the pasta component, the rice component, uh, the polenta component, um, the cheeses, uh, and uh, the diversified cheeses, the uh, the uh, of course, the pecorino being the two big ones, and then of course all the soft cheeses from Lombardia, Gorgonzola, Taleggio, and so on, and Piedmont. Um, talking about uh, uh, the tomatoes, which is now essential, although, you know, again, it's a new world of fruit. It only came to Italy uh, after, after Columbus discovered America and it developed. So did uh, uh, peppers. Peppers is a new world. <coughs> so they, now, let me, the pepper, again, Italian-American peppers are used much more in Italian-American cuisine than we use them in Italy. <coughs> and that's, again, when those immigrants came, that was one element that they recognized sort of, and they used a lot of. Um, uh, going back to 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 the uh, vegetables, you know the, the, the Italian sort of vegetables, the cipolle, because each the vegetable families basically uh, are not that different from culture to culture, but there are differences <coughs> in, in 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 how these vegetables are really grown that make a big difference. Um, it's, it's just you know endless for you. <coughs> um, any other questions? Yes. Well, from watching your show, I find I watch it not just for the food, but also the way you move in such a relaxed way, such a joyful way. So for me, it's a kind of stress releaser just to watch it. My friends, the way you throw salt, just the chicken. Right? And it's, it's really such a stress reliever. How do you, though, keep yourself with all your restaurants? I'm just saying that the work is having to travel and fly. How do you kind of keep yourself? You unstress me, but how do you keep yourself unstressed? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I do have to, from time to time, pay attention to, to you know, I get over, over stress and then I just cut out. I really do. I, I love nature. I love uh, music and art. Uh, I love the water. So sailing really does it for me. But um, uh, I think that what, what you see is <coughs> me being very comfortable with my element and in a comfortable setting. And um, I, I, I just, it, it is in my house. When I was first asked to, to do a television show, uh, and that came after I had done some with Julia Child. Julia Child, I did a friend of mine for Lydia, she came in, and uh, I said, Lydia, you know, she was doing a show, would you mind doing two shows? And I said, of course, I'd love to. And uh, after that, of course, the producers came, you know, you know you're pretty good, would you like it? And I said, yes, but I have two requests. One, that I do it in my home, in my kitchen, because that gave me a sense of comfort and knowing mm -hmm. all the elements, you know, I, I knew my, what everything was, so that I can talk and project. And the other one was to be on PBS, uh, in that sort of uh, setting of, of, of teaching. Because I knew that I, I wanted to communicate something. You know, it's just, just beyond 
you know, how, how you cut onions and, and whatever. Um, uh, so so it, it's coming across, uh, uh, and um, uh, my, my mannerism, I, I think it's, um, it's something, you know, that happens as you develop yourself as a person and with your, with your own sentiments and come to terms and understanding spiritually, emotionally, all those things uh, have a play. Uh, I mean, I, I think that, that food is sacred, you know, as far as wasting food and all that. And I think, you know, people tell me that how I handle food, I, I need to touch food for me to, food sort of communicates to me how I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do with them when I touch it, or with it when I touch it. And I guess all that comes across, unbeknownst to me, it's not that I plan to do that. It's something that happens beyond maybe my cognitive messages. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? We noticed in your kitchen that you have um, a wall oven. Is that a, a, a bread oven or a... No, that's, that's a rotisserie and a grill. And I used it, uh, uh, I think, in the show once or twice. Uh, I realized that my quest is for people to do the food that I do. And I know that not many people will have that. So I don't use it as much. You know, it's not about what I have, what I can do. It's about what I can have you do, in a sense. So, but it's a great, great little, um, it's, not, it's, it's uh, you know, live uh, wood. Uh, uh, it's a griddle, it's a rotisserie too, and then there's a, 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 a shoot, you know, that takes the smoke right up. So, and that little round thing that you see is a piece of metal that you take off, and it, you, when you put it on, it reflects the heat back onto what you're cooking. So it's this, this rounded metal on the stainless steel uh, color. Yes. Just a comment. My 10-year-old son is in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> we often have to change the meal based on what you're cooking on TV. <laughs> That's wonderful. I get a tremendous amount of emails. And the dearest ones are the ones from, from the young children. Mm -hmm. I get pictures from them, I get messages, and I make sure that I respond to them. Uh, I will make sure to tell him that. <laughs> you, you tell him that, and can I make the connection here now, remember. Um, so I have uh, uh, five grandchildren, I mean I have four, this one's coming. And um, <coughs> I have them in the kitchen all the time. I, I think that uh, uh, children uh, today are really deprived of the beauty of connecting with food through food. My children love to uh, and and <coughs> the writer, when I see coming across that, uh, I'm actually working on a, on a, on a, on a show uh, for children uh, and uh, use, using a child as a, as a medium to connect to their parents and all that and bring them in and bring mm -hmm. things together. So I hope it works out. Mm -hmm. yes. The, the one basic food that I don't see Italians making in Italy is bread. And I wonder if you would like to see more Italians making their own um, bread. I, I think that the culture is, of bread in Italy is well in the line. But you have the funny feature. And in Italy what you have, you have the small artisans, which is which is a, a, an art that is, is not here, you know. What we, what we have here is in, you, you sort of do it yourself at home, or you go to the big, uh, big uh, uh, stores and big producers. And the beauty of Italy is precisely that you have the small uh, uh, the feature, the, 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 the Salomayo, the Novicino, all of these little artisans that are specialists in what they do, uh, and, uh, and they do it well. Uh, so therefore, the necessity of, of, of uh, so even in the cities of Italy, you have this sort of artisan product. Although if you go out in the countryside, people still make bread, and they still make the, the uh, 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 yes. Have you found much cross pollination between regions in Italy now? Oh no, Italy is still very, <laughs> very, still <laughs> very well. I, think I shouldn't say that the, 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 the cities are not, but the beauty of Italy is its regions, mm -hmm. precisely uh, from dialects to customs <coughs> to foods to music. Uh, it, I, I still go to Italy in the oldest years. Uh, I, I always find something new uh, in every region. So is it crossing? Yes, I think there's uh, some homogenization happening in, it, in Italy as far as food in the big cities. Around. But if you go out of the big cities, the small towns are still very much into their tradition, and it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yes? I'm Um, 
I do. Um, I love uh, the Oriental cuisine. I love Chinese. Uh, I love Thai, uh, Korean. Although uh, it intrigues me, even um, you know, the Middle Eastern cuisines, the Greek, they all intrigue me. Because um, what I look, in, uh, I mean, I guess I, just, uh, but I look in, into them. Where do I do I see any connection? Do I see anything similar to to the Italian? And you know, for me, you know. Comparing, comparing what to, what does that culture do and and how it differs from ours. But the Oriental, I like the Oriental very much, yeah. and it's quite similar to the Italian. But I think it's quite <coughs> you mentioned when the Italians first came over here, the Italian American cuisine felt because they didn't have the products they had from back home. As those products became more available in the United States, how did the uh, Italian American cuisine change? Uh, I think that uh, now there's 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 um, a complete availability. I uh, opened my first restaurant in '71. I couldn't get a bowl of rice, and if I, if you don't have a bowl of rice, you don't make a decent risotto. Uh, so I had to make risottos with long grain rice, which uh, you know were just because the long grain rice did not release the starches that were stronger, so you didn't get the creaminess. Uh, so you know, I first-hand experienced. So it hasn't been that long that uh, we, we, we have, uh, I would say now that we have most of, or, or, if not almost all of the products that one finds in it, you could find them here if you, if you research. Uh, you would ask, how does the two cuisine, um, there's, there's still um, a, a parallel to each other in the sense in Italian American cuisine, although there, there, there is a, a crossing over of the two, and I think that the two will end up sort of homogenizing at some, at some point, uh, and forming, I don't know. It's, I think it's it's an interesting question. Yes. Another question on um, visiting relatives in Italy. It seemed that they were a little bit lax in um, uh, being cautious as far as refrigeration is concerned. Like they seemed like they left everything out. <laughs> 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 Is yeah. that true, or is it just a misconception? It is. But they, they, uh, there's a completely different threshold of, 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 the, of the palate as far as temperature is concerned, and it's it's one of the one of the um, problems. Not a problem because, but Americans like it to extreme, right? very cold and very hot. <coughs> uh, they need to really be uh, sort of stimulated on the top. Uh, and I think that uh, you really maximize your flavor of something uh, when you are as <coughs> closer to your body as possible, maybe a little warmer so you get the blood flowing and whatever, you're more sensitive. But uh, it is a definite cultural difference. Uh, Italians do not like ice in their drinks uh, because they're going to get uh, uh, stomach pain. It's, 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 it's cultural. Cultural, but it does make sense as far as as far as uh, 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 your 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 capability of tasting the things, you know, because cold temperature accent uh, the, the the tasting of the saltiness and whatever, hot or cold and so on, um, and uh, room temperature. I like my food at room temperature too. I like my cheese certainly at room temperature. So I retained a lot of that because I can really taste the flavors. So now, they did it because that's the way they like it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what he was talking about also was, um, I had this experience when friends came from Tuscany, they made roast rabbit, and the leftovers they did not want to refrigerate. They wanted to leave it out on the counter, this was in the summer, and I was horrified. And then once in their home, they made rabbit, and it was left over, they must have made two or three rabbits, for three or four days, we didn't eat it, but it was it just stored in their oven, and they ate it. So that he does what he was talking yeah. about was that they don't have that that uh, sensibility that we have about as soon as you it's cooked and you're not eating it. Yeah, well, because they didn't have access to the refrigerator on top, although that no longer is true. There is that food changes if you put it in the refrigerator. It really does. Even if you reheat it, it doesn't taste the same. And uh, that might be one. And 
the consciousness uh, to health, I think that they, they pay attention. I know that when we did it, we either always covered it with, with a kitchen towel or with another plate. The concern was of, of, of if something is cooked and most of the bacteria is killed, then it should it should uh, maintain uh, its, its, its condition, unless you introduce bacteria somehow uh, again. <coughs> so uh, the concern was that flies wouldn't introduce anything, all those stuff. That's, that's not completely true because bacteria get regenerated within itself. So, uh, but uh, I don't remember, I think that we were very conscious of when a food was not good. And and it, it took over, you know, that sort of fermentation or, or and, um, but I remember food being left back all the time with, with another plate on top of it or a thin kitchen towel. And uh, the flavors are maintained closer. Yeah. Yes. My question is about vegetables. Is it American influence that vegetables are cooked authentically? Because growing up, my mother always cooked vegetables. He yeah, and he was healthy, yeah. but they were not. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's a whole movement of nutrition and the validity, you know, of the nutritional uh, value of, of vegetable. And if you cook it, you lose a lot of it. Uh, you are absolutely right. What I remember is cooking this vegetable as a child. The texture of vegetables were cooked in that mush, but they were they were they were, they were, they were, they were they delicious. Were I just had this discussion uh, with, with with the doctor, and I and, and he said, uh, I said, you know, I I think we were talking about different uh, nourishments and all that, and we're talking about uh, vegetables. And he says, well, you know, if they're undercooked, you're, you're, you're losing a lot of the vitamin C's and, and all of that if you overcook them. And I said, um, <coughs> fine, but if because they're undercooked, because the cellulose is not broken down, you don't assimilate, it just passes you through. So uh, what is the value? You know, if you break down the vegetable and you're really able to get more vitamins out of it because the vegetable has been made accessible to your, to your system to absorb it? Or is it that you need more, veg more nourishment in the vegetable itself and then you let sort of your system fend and pull out as much as it can? It, it hasn't been, that, that sort of comparison hasn't been made. So um, even though I'm of, of, of the top, I love my vegetable a little bit more, just when they begin to cross over. I don't like them really olive, olive green, but just when they begin to press